Cyber security is like terrorism. You have to be good on every day. Yes. Uh, and the bad guys have to be good just one just one, one time. We will do in the next 10 years what China has spent 200 billion dollars and could not do in the last 20 years. We were nothing in electronics in 2014. Right. We were importing all our phones. Phones, right? Yeah. And today we make all our phones in India. Right. We were exporting zero. Mm. I always say zero but sanata that we were that was our exports. Huh. And today we are exporting 1 lakh crores. There is a history of Indian semiconductors which if today somebody publishes mm. as a history book, mm. it will make a lot of people blush. I see. It will make a people lot of people embarrassed and deeply ashamed. Right. that they let down our country like this repeatedly over the many years. Rajiv Chandrasekhar ji, thank you so much for being on the Abhijit Tata podcast and thank you for hosting me. Thank you office. Abhijit, thank you for having me. Absolutely sir. So sir, uh, there's a lot I would like to talk about but we'll focus on a, on, on a few things. Right now the G20 summit is coming up. So what is the role of the ministries you're holding in the G20 summit and what, have, what should we look forward to? Look, uh, you know, we don't have a particular role uh, in, in the hosting of the G20, but one of the clear conversations uh, that the G20 countries have had mm -hmm. over the last one year under Prime Minister Narendra Modi's presidency has been the power of technology to transform lives of people. Mm -hmm. And you know, the narrative and discourse around technology used to be always about innovation, yes. about the next unicorn or the billionaires or the big SIs of the world or the big techs of the world. Mm. But India has really, in a lot of ways, brought into the G20 this very, very compelling narrative about how technology can change the lives of people, can transform governance, can bring trust at an unprecedented levels between government and citizen or lack thereof mm -hmm. if, if there is no trust. So I think uh, that DPI story of India, mm -hmm. how Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji in a way has transformed the narrative of dysfunctional governance in India, which was the story about India for 65-70 years. Yes. Ki chalta hai, pe corruption hi hai. All that has been turned on its head by saying here is this country that has seemingly taken an impossible uh, dysfunctional governance of a large democracy and made it this very responsible, very responsive, very modern, mm. very fast respond acting uh, technology driven uh, government and governance mm. at this scale. Yes. Uh, if it was a small country, fine, people would say, okay, good idea, good story. But that a country, a big elephant that was going in a particular direction of dysfunctionality has been turned around. And that elephant is today pounding the pavement, if you want to call it that, and demonstrating uh, growth and progress at a level that the world is admiring. Mm -hmm. That certainly has got everybody's attention in the G20. And that we have deployed technology not to cause any harm, right, but yes. really to do good, mm. which has always been the underlying story of technology, but has always been, uh, uh, you know, has butted heads with, in a way, with all the harms that have come about in the previous uh, few years uh, about technology in general. Right. So we are offering the India stack architecture Absolutely. to the entire world, to essentially the, to the global south. Yes. In what ways can they benefit from it? No, look, uh, I think. The challenges that India had for the last 65 years, if you want to call it challenges mm -hmm. or the dysfunctionality is the same thing that many countries uh, deal with, which yes. is, but maybe at a smaller scale, mm -hmm. which is how do you take governance to the remotest parts of a island nation, mm. which has 25 islands and there are sparsely inhabited uh, uh, habitations. Mm. How do you take governance there? Uh, this is not an unusual uh, use case about how do you build these bridges between government and state capitals on the one hand and a distant citizen on the other hand. Mm. And in the, in the past, this used to take all kinds of physical intermediation, a government office that requires cost, then you need people there to man those offices, then yeah. you have the issue of integrity of those people who are dealing with the monies of uh, citizens. So all of that model has now been collapsed into these powerful technology pipes technology bridges, mm. which we refer to as India stack and now we rebranded as India DPI, okay. which even for a small country is of great interest to them. 
because they also want to save the money on the offices they also want to create direct br bridges between government and the citizen so india is in a lot of ways is showing this example of how even the remotest community today is connected to delhi hmm. or connected to their state capital not because of big buildings or many many offices but because of technology right so you took over the ministries of the the portfolio that you have in 2021 what right. were the main focus areas that you had look i think uh, really the vision of uh, continuing to propel prime minister narendra modi ji's vision that india a needs to continue to deploy technology to improve the lives of our citizens so mm -hmm. that is one goal he has put down as a marker firmly the second is that we need to create more and more innovation in our country and that the digital economy must grow as a pie of the gdp we were 4% in 2014 we are about 11% today mm -hmm. and we will be 20% of the gdp by 2026 okay so growth of that digital economy automatically means for younger and younger indians more and more opportunities at startups entrepreneurship innovation and so in a lot of ways the digital india program has done what we have never been able to do for 30 40 50 years which is youngsters are now economic participants and are contributing to creating economic activity and wealth at a rate unprecedented in the history of india right otherwise remember the narrative about the youth was ye job dekhenge they will go looking for job they will seek job mm. they are essentially constantly job seekers but in a space of 5 years prime minister narendra modi ji has changed the narrative of youth into not just about job seekers of course there are many youth who want jobs and they yeah. will continue to get job but to a large number of them creating jobs creating investments because of the innovation hmm. creating economic activity and growth hmm. so this is an unprecedented time for the youth to be almost like a uh, important part of uh, the journey of india so hmm. that is the second and the third important goal uh, that was clear to me in 2021 hmm. was that india for many many decades used to consume technology yes we were buying everything yeah i mean the laptops and the hardware and the software and everything came from abroad and we were essentially doing some it it as work which is also a services. good thing we were doing services and supporting other people's ip yes prime minister was very clear that we have to move transform india into being a designer architect owner of products platforms and solutions mm. and devices mm. and today when you look at chandrayaan yes okay uh, it is it is an amazing but real manifestation of that vision of our prime minister yes in 2015 which is that you have semiconductors in chandrayaan's vikram lander that are designed and developed and manufactured in india indeed we have software and sub systems that are designed developed and manufactured by by msmes and uh, startups so uh, i mean today when the world looks at chandrayaan it is not just about oh we are the fourth largest fourth country to reach the moon or the first country to reach the south pole those are important milestone but that a country could pull off such a complex project mm -hmm. such a sophisticated project that is at the intersection of science and engineering yes and can do it successfully and do it in a way that is uh, not just rivaling but is surpassing the other actors in the space yes. is is a testimony to the deep capabilities and technologies and project management that the last 5 to 9 years have created in our country right so that third promise of his that india will not just be a consumer india will be atmanirbhar bharat and a producer of the next generation of cutting edge technologies hmm. we are well on our way to achieve that right atmanirbhar bharat is extremely important and and i always say on my on hmm. my channel that uh, whether it's it is uh, whether it is uh, it is space or it is uh, quantum or it is uh, artificial intelligence the the nations that will lead the world in in these fields in the 21st century are the nations that will essentially f uh, decide the future of humanity absolutely so uh, where are we on on this on no, this and uh, you are absolutely right abhijit because i think there are two trends that uh, i mean i'm sure your audience knows you certainly know that a digitization and technology are going to be increasingly bigger bigger pieces of what the global economy is going to look like yes and our lives are going to look like yes. i mean we are going to be much more digitized than ever before in the coming years hmm. the economy is going to be much more digital led in the uh, in the in the coming years yes and uh, it used to be the case that technology used to be the property of or the uh, the preserve, uh, the preserve of a few countries hmm. yes i think it is clear now uh, with the agreements that india has with the us recently signed with the prime minister's historic visit 
with the agreements that India has with the EU in the Technology Trade Council agreements, India's agreements with Japan on semiconductors and critical technologies. And you, this basically means that the future of tech, mm -hmm. which as I've already said is so important for our future in general, the future of tech will no longer be architected by one or two countries or one or two companies, but it will be by a group of countries that have similar values, mm. similar thinking about technology benefiting people at large. Yes. And certainly India is going to be in that leading pack of nations. Whether India will be with one other country or two other countries or three other countries, that only time will tell and the future will tell. Mm. But certainly our ambition as a country, that this ambition that has been very clearly articulated and drummed into our heads by our leader, our prime minister, is that we have to be at the cutting edge hmm. of the future of tech. Right. So if it's AI, if it's semiconductors, if it's microelectronics, it's the internet with 6G, it is, uh, you know, IoT and industrial automation, hmm. industry 4.0, all of these areas, we have to not just say that we will import substitute, but that we have to be at the cutting edge of innovation and that people have to respect us not just from our capability to ideate and to execute, but also to ideate, execute and deliver innovation. Right. And so that is why Prime Minister Narendra Modi in 2021 on Independence Day said the next decade is going to be called the India Decade. Mm, okay. And he said that this India Decade is going to be a decade of technology opportunities and that that decade or that India Decade will be in a sense architected by and built by young Indians from all over the country. So his vision of the place for India in the future of tech, his vision for the place of India in the future of global economy, he's already very clear. He said we want to be the third largest economy in the next three years. And his future, that this future of India, hmm. his vision that this future of India will be in a large part built by the energy and the capabilities of our youngsters mm -hmm. is also very clear. Right. So that makes the job of people like me in the ministry or and many of my colleagues in, in the Council of Ministers that much of, that much easier because we know exactly what his goals and ambitions for New India is, mm -hmm. what his thinking is and it is for us to deliver. Right. Let's take semiconductors for, for yeah. example. By 2030, hopefully we should be a major uh, powerhouse in semiconductor yeah. conductor manufacturing. How are we going about doing this? No, look, so a good question, Abjit, and you know, I'm sure you know uh, very clearly that semiconductors is not a uh, is not an overnight game. No, it's not. Uh, and it, especially in the Indian context, because we have had about 70 years or 65 years of missed opportunities. Yes. There is a history of Indian semiconductors, which if today somebody publishes hmm. as a history book, hmm. it will make a lot of people blush. I see. It will make a people, lot of people embarrassed and deeply ashamed right. that they let down our country like this repeatedly over the many years. I see. There were so many opportunities that this country had. Hmm. So many companies that came to us all the way back from 1957 okay all and to as recently as 2012 but the governments the political leadership of the time did not have the vision mm. did not have the sense did not have the instinct to understand how important technology is in particular mm. uh, in general and how important semiconductors would be in particular okay it is in 2021 that prime minister post covid as we were coming out of covid understood and very quickly uh, with very little uh, marketing from uh, us in the ministry supported our endeavor mm -hmm. and uh, set out the semiconductor policy mm -hmm. it has got 10 billion dollars 76000 crores of funding which uh, is to be applied to incentives for manufacturing incentives for packaging units incentives for design and innovation and incentives to and funding for research and uh, uh, and capability development and skills mm -hmm. Uh, and that I think is adequate capital and I say to people that uh, and I make this uh, this is not an empty promise or an empty thread I'm not, I'm not used to that is that we will demonstrate to the world that in the next decade we would with this type of capital and with our innovation and ingenuity that we already have we will do in the next 10 years what China has spent 200 billion dollars and could not do in the last 20 years fantastic Okay. Okay. So we clearly know, and you already see the first marker on the ground with the Micron memory packaging unit in Gujarat. Mm -hmm. Already there are 30 design startups that are doing chip design. 
the like i told you the vikram lander chip was designed was done by a cl hmm. the navic chip was done by again a partnership between the government and a private sector company mm -hmm. that will soon uh, propel and uh, and, and uh, fire up all the gps systems and all the smartphones and smart devices okay yeah so that is already done okay and we have like i said uh, another 20 to 25 Indian startups doing chip design in a spectrum of uh, um, uh, applications ranging from AI compute to uh, sensors to wireless to automotive. So mm -hmm. a whole s a spectrum of uh, very ingenuous uh, work that is being done. We have also as a government of India fully supported mm -hmm. the risk 5 independent open source uh, independent um, instruction set architecture uh, of risk 5 and created an indian framework called the dir 5 the digital india risk 5 uh, program okay. which is being uh, lead managed by professor kam koti the director of id chennai uh -huh. he is the chief architect of it and we have a program manager in the cdac which is the Center for Development of Advanced Computing in the Government of India, mm -hmm. who is the program management of the DIR-5. So we see uh, at least six to ten devices, mm -hmm. chips, coming out of there and taping out by uh, mid to end of 2024. I see. Yes. Uh, AI is a big thing now. Yes. It's been a perfect storm of computing power and data sets, large data sets. Correct. What is India doing to be, to be the uh, leader in this? Good, uh, uh, extremely good question. India's uh, focus, our Prime Minister's focus on AI is a very medium to long term. So, okay. we are not getting distracted by all the uh, you know the buzz around chat GPT yeah. and you know everybody today is very fashionable to talk about AI and we are very laser focused on our mission which is to create uh, build the most complex and diverse data sets program mm -hmm. uh, which will be under our, our entire effort is called the India AI uh, program and uh, we will have a a global summit just like we have semiconductors which will become a must attend program for ai okay. in october of 2023 that will okay. be the first edition of it so the pieces are we'll do the india data sets program that is already under way mm -hmm. and the india data sets program will be uh, complemented by uh, ai compute capacity that we are also uh, asking the government to support financially mm -hmm. we will create significant ai compute uh, capacity for okay. startups to use so that they are not limited by that okay and most importantly for you to uh, for you and your audience to understand our focus is as much about applications of ai mm -hmm. uh, as a, as opposed to just building these large language models or foundational models mm -hmm. and demonstrating some capability yeah. of course ai research is going to be a prime focus but we are really also equally focused on creating ai talent mm -hmm. And creating a curriculum that encourages AI talent to be created up by our education system, mm. but focusing on healthcare, governance, and automotive mm. and autonomous vehicles. Many of these areas we are focusing on from an application standpoint. Okay. We want to create more and more startups that will build AI applications and mm. AI innovations. Mm -hmm. Yes, we also want our own sort of marker on the ground about. Uh, you know, like ChatGPT and uh, generative AI and uh, LLMs and foundational model, mm. but equally focused is our effort to create an innovation ecosystem that is really creating cutting edge applications that are powered by AI and AI models. Right. So we are interested in the applications as much as we are interested in the underlying models and the underlying data sets that train the models. Right. Another very important em emerging technology is quantum computing. Absolutely. And uh, there are certain countries that seem to have a crack to quantum supremacy where are we in this no so, so this uh, certainly uh, look uh, it, it will seem to people that we are behind the curve uh, because you know google talks about quantum and other countries talk about quantum a lot mm -hmm. but i don't believe that i think uh, you know the government of india prime minister has recently sanctioned a significant amount of money of almost 8500 crores mm -hmm. for a quantum mission i think we are at the starting stage pretty much with all the other countries of the world. Mm -hmm. You can argue that somebody has a six month head start on Maybe. us or yeah. three months. But our capabilities and our view and vision mm -hmm. of quantum and where we want to get on quantum are very, very clearly defined. Mm -hmm. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that in the area of quantum, especially with the partnerships in ISET, uh, with, with the US and other countries that we have signed and our growing capabilities in semiconductors and uh, in compute that uh, quantum uh, is certainly in the India decade roadmap. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want to tell you anything about specific milestones about we will have the first quantum computer on so-and-so, so-and-so date, etc, mm -hmm. etc. Et but 
I can tell you that the lot of work and there is a very very healthy and uh, fast growing community of researchers okay. and innovators in the quantum space which is really the uh, seed capital if you want to call it yes. for a quantum ecosystem right uh, another thing that we uh, obviously need to focus on in cyber is cyber security absolutely and data privacy and all that so what is the work no, look this? cyber security is an issue that worries uh, countries and governments all over the world yes. you know cyberspace has no borders you mm. cannot uh, un unless you're a china and you sort of firewall your entire country yes. uh, most uh, open democracies and liberal countries like ours don't uh, we 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 operate the free on open internet mm. uh, and our view uh, in policy making around the internet is driven by what the prime minister said is, is about safety and trust okay and safety and trust the corollary of that or the recipro reciprocal concept is cyber security hmm. and cyber harm yes so we are uh, deeply concerned and we, of course the legislative framework we will be uh, laying out very clearly at the end of this or end of this month is already over so early part of september okay. through the digital india act uh -huh. It will be a completely revamped, modern approach towards uh, uh, addressing the issues of harms and securities for an individual or a business mm -hmm. on the internet. But the deep tech capabilities required mm -hmm. to manage, uh, you know, malware libraries and mm -hmm. manage uh, responses and uh, remediation of uh, um, ransomware attacks and deliberate uh, breaches mm -hmm. is something that we have slowly and steadily built considerable amount of capacity for in India. Okay, and. Uh, but uh, you know, cyber security is like terrorism. You have to be good on every day. Yes. Uh, and the bad guys have to be good just one, just one, day. one time. Yes. So in a lot of ways, mm. this is an area that we are very focused on. Mm. But in India, there is a particular unique challenge that we have because the nature of cyber security is that the criminal is in one jurisdiction, the crime is in a second jurisdiction and the victim is in a third jurisdiction usually. Yes. They don't have all happen uh, next door to yes. each other. But given the law and order in India as a state subject, mm. it certainly makes very difficult to identify, investigate and prosecute cyber fraud, cyber crimes mm. because the victim may be in Bengaluru, yes. the criminal may be in some other state and the bank account or whichever else which is a target of the uh, the crime mm. is in a third state yes now three police officers and three police jurisdictions have to cooperate co collaborate and cooperate mm. and in many states unfortunately cyber crime continues to be low on the priority for because of the uh, undermanning of the police station and the police forces mm. because for them violent crime rape safety law and order murders these are all much more higher precedence mm. than uh, uh, somebody losing one lakh rupees or, or being you know fished for his account or his uh, the same being fixed for his data right so we have a lot of work to do. We have these yearly, every year, twice a year, we have meetings with the IT ministers of various states. Okay. And we are increasingly trying to sensitize every state government that while there is normal conventional crime, that crimes on the cyberspace equally impact citizens mm -hmm. and they must build their capabilities and capacities to investigate every reported crime. Uh, otherwise, you will have a situation where people lose faith in the ability of the local police to investigate and uh, prosecute those uh, cyber crimes and therefore that will just keep increasing because mm. people think that cyberspace is a space where the law arm of the law does not reach and therefore people who violate the law have a free pass so that perception is a dangerous perception uh, in some states it works very well mm -hmm. Many state police departments are very, very active and have very well developed uh, tools and systems to uh, to uh, to sort of uh, mitigate cyber crimes and cyber uh, frauds. Mm -hmm. But many state governments don't. Okay. And so what the criminals do is they use those jurisdictions uh -huh. to operate. I see. Knowing fully well that they are in some sort of a safe haven. Okay. Or uh, let's say safer haven. Safer haven. Yeah. So, is there a case for creating a separate police force for cyber for cyber police? No, no. I, I mean, look, we can't do that. We are, we live in a democracy. We are a federal democracy. Mm. States have law and order, mm -hmm. uh, as uh, decided by the constitution. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think uh, it, this is really about creating more and more awareness. I think more and more people, more and more uh, you know champions like you, when you start talking to your own state governments and say, look, we are not happy with the kind of preparation or the readiness that you have mm. in uh, in protecting citizens in the cyberspace mm. against cyber crime uh, even though the law provides for it 
uh, then uh, then governments will start responding right social media has to really unified india for, for the first time in a thousand years maybe yeah and everybody is on a foreign social media platform so how do we get these foreign social media platforms to abide by our rules we know what happened yeah, with yeah. twitter and all that so, yeah. so how do we no, do so the first of all is that they have to abide by the rules okay. i think uh, if there is anybody who's foreign and he's big tech and thinks that uh, the laws of india don't apply hmm. uh, they they have been reminded recently on many occasions that the laws of india do apply okay and i'll give you two examples I, you know twitter has uh, got that message uh, uh, meta which is the other large social media company certainly has got uh, clear messages from the courts and the uh, system at large that mm -hmm. there is no two duality about the uh, the appliance uh, the, the compliance with the indian law mm -hmm. uh, we saw the, the big company like google uh, being um, being prosecuted for by the competition commission mm -hmm. and its order being upheld by the enclat on unfair uh, market power being used by platforms mm -hmm. so Uh, it is clear now even to the biggest of the lot that in india there are certain rules and laws that have been developed to protect the citizen mm -hmm. there are rules and laws protect to develop the small businesses mm -hmm. and that regardless of how fancy your company is and where you are headquartered or what your accent is or what uh, capabilities you have yes. at the bottom uh, uh, at the uh, at the at the end of the day the government of prime minister narendra modi ji will be uh unrelenting in terms of the compliance of the law mm -hmm. uh, we don't expect anything else from them we don't want them to send me diwali baskets or any of that mm -hmm. we certainly expect only from them one thing that the laws that have been designed to protect the indian citizens must always be complied with right so do we have new laws that deal with social media yeah so you know, the first uh, piece of this global modern legislative framework that prime minister narendra modi ji is building is mm -hmm. the digital personal data protection bill okay that certainly will put a break mm -hmm. on all these platforms who are misusing personal data and exploiting okay. personal data uh -huh. it will create deep behavioral changes and uh, like using the word symmetry there used to be an asymmetry between these big guys and the indian citizen yes. and they could take any data they could use it for any purpose and the poor citizen would never be even aware of it yes and that symmetry and that deep behavioral change will be brought in by the D digital personal data protection bill okay the bill as at its heart uh, the uh government's intention to protect the citizen mm -hmm. and of course give uh, the innovation ecosystem the legitimate lawful uses of personal data right the second piece of the legislative framework uh, uh that the prime minister is uh, has uh, envisioned is the digital india act uh -huh. and that the act is ready okay. and is ready for consultation and it will be out there uh, in the public domain very shortly mm -hmm. that talks about the broader uh, principles of openness mm -hmm. Uh, uh, free and fair competition it talks about user safety and trust okay that talks about harm criminalities in ext ex uh, extensive ways mm -hmm. it talks about accountability if you have a problem with a platform how what is legally provided in terms of making them accountable okay. to you mm -hmm. it also recognizes that the internet today is a very different internet from 20 years ago absolutely we have a large number of very different intermediaries there are e-commerce guys there are ai guys there are social media guys there are uh, content managers there are different different types of intermediaries with very different functionality mm -hmm. and who need to be regulated differently right yes. there is no point regulating an e-commerce guy like you'll regulate a uh, social media guy hmm. or there's certainly no way of regulating a social media guy uh, the way you regulate an edutech uh, platform for children yes so we have in a sense designed uh, or created an architecture of the internet mm -hmm. which uh, recognizes that there are very diverse and different types of intermediaries that need to have very different thresholds of regulation and compliance right one of the issues with social media is misinformation correct and that can be used to actually influence elections and absolutely, absolutely. In, uh, absolutely. interference how does india de well, have to deal with that this is a very good question abhijit and i think more and more youngsters and more and more people who get into this conversation and narrative is very important misinformation is no longer some innocent aberrational behavior it's not these are all very deliberate conspiratorial state actor led types of offensive cyber attacks yes 
एंड मिस इन्फॉर्मेशन इज नो लॉन्ग जज इनोसेंट स्लिप ऑफ द टंग मैंने कुछ बोल दिया गलती से इज नो लॉन्ग दैट इज ऑल वेरी 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 डीपली प्लान टाइप्स ऑफ मैशिनेशन वी सॉ रिसेंटली खालिस्तानी एलिमेंट्स विथ थाउजेंड अकाउंट्स वॉशिंगटन पोस्ट रिपोर्टेड दैट स्टोरी हाउ दे वर क्रिएटिंग अ नरेटिव विद मिस इन्फॉर्मेशन अबाउट हाउ द गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया परपेट्रेटिंग वायलेंस ऑन अ पर्टिकुलर कम्युनिटी इन पंजाब दे वर ऑल लाइज राइट एंड द मिस इन्फॉर्मेशन वॉज इंसाइटिंग वायलेंस अगेंस्ट पीपल ऑफ द इंडियन गवर्नमेंट ओके सो मिस इन्फॉर्मेशन टूडे इज अ वेपनाइज form of user harm hmm. it is a harm because we want people to go to the internet 1.2 billion indians who use the internet should be able to look at the internet look at some information there and say ha ha and trust it yes now what is happening is if you go to the internet you don't know what is fake what is right who is saying it de- decides whether it's right or wrong hmm. and you are constantly being uh, second guessed yes. on what is correct and uh, false yes. uh, so therefore we believe the internet should be safe and trusted hmm. why that is so important for india is india is not everybody is not a phd and a masters in digital technology yes. you we have people using the internet that are far remote parts of india who may not be digitally literate hmm. who may just be using the internet for their pensions for their subsidies for education for skilling yes. and uh, if they are targeted for misinformation they can suddenly uh, get very angry get upset we saw this in manipur mm, there yes. were some people trying to do misinformation with mm. the army officers okay. uh, and uh, their identity so we think misinformation is a very very big issue on the internet mm-hmm. and the digital india act certainly in the it rules we have created created a framework to outlaw misinformation in the digital india act we will be a lot tougher about everything that represents harm mm-hmm. everything that represents cyber criminality okay another two categories are online dating sites or or apps and online gaming correct apps. how do we regulate those so the, they are like i said the the digital india act will recognize different types of intermediary different. so dating apps will mm. be matchmaking apps will be a different type of intermediary mm. and they will have different regulations that we will create in consultation with the national commission of women national uh, ncpc and the national commission protecting child rights okay we and with the home ministry right saying that if you are a dating app mm. it is it should not be a cover for something illegal right yes it cannot be suddenly uh, undertaking prostitution on one and by calling mm. yourself dating app mm. or the flip side you cannot be misleading and uh, scamming mm. uh, gullible people on the dating sites with money or anything else so yes. there will be a set of regulations for date uh, gaming i'm sorry dating sites uh, da- dating intermediaries right S- similarly for online gaming we have already carved out the framework it is already uh, uh, notified as in rules under mm. the current act of the it act mm. but we think we will go further in the dia and create a framework that will effectively define what is good gaming mm-hmm. and what is outlawed gaming okay. okay and that is essentially the the how we are regulating gaming mm-hmm. we are saying there is permissible online gaming which is what is non addictive mm-hmm. does not include ga- involve gambling okay. and does not have any other harm in the game of uh creating insight inciting violence against a particular community or a particular gender mm-hmm. if you don't have harm you are not addictive and you don't involve gambling you are today permitted on the indian internet if you violate one of these three you are not permitted on the indian internet okay how do we know what's addictive and what's not yeah so therefore uh, good 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 quest- good question we have come up with the concept of having these self regulatory bodies mm-hmm. which will co- comprise of number of people including lawyers and let's say child rights uh, people mm-hmm. child uh, uh, protection people mm-hmm. teachers parents okay and the gaming industry mm-hmm. and they will time on time to time evolve the jurisprudence of the framework of what is addictive or not addictive okay is it just about limiting access out to so many hours or is it about the content that you will look at mm-hmm. that is something that the government will not prescribe it is for something that these srbs the self regulatory bodies with these membership will continuously evolve mm-hmm. as what is addictive as the okay. definition keeps changing right yes because you know what is addictive today may not be what is addictive tomorrow yes it evolves. or it may be even more complex yes. in terms of defining what is addictive so we, in everything we are doing abhijit we are allowing the laws and the rules and the guidelines to keep evolving as we say face up to new challenges and new changes mm-hmm. and in the technology space you will be the first one to agree 
disruption is the normal it is yes yes what what tomorrow is i can't anticipate even today yes correct so therefore we have to be prepared for almost being on a treadmill that is constantly moving hmm. and uh, and we have to keep running to keep staying in the same place yes so that flexibility we need all our laws of in design like that that will say that if there is a sudden thing that we had no, uh, we have an envisage into 2023 that we see in 2025 mm-hmm. that we don't have to go back to the drawing board we can just simply create subordinate legislation say we will deal with that issue as well right uh, there, there's so much indian talent abroad and who are working in all these high tech fields and sure, all sure. is there any any any, uh, any way of uh, bring, bring them back, bring them back like I, bring them back i am i am telling you and I, i from my perspective where i have i obviously have some visibility i am seeing a very different uh, very different um, sort of a movement okay people are coming back okay increasingly mm-hmm. and i use one example to showcase this there is a gentleman called jim keller Hmm? Jim Keller he was an AI architect ah, of yes. Tesla yes 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 and he's a very i mean in this valley and in the area of semiconductors a very respected person yes. very i mean he's a is a maverick inventor designer but an extremely sharp person yes he sets up two semiconductor design chip design startups where does he set it up bangalore yes right yes, yes. so hmm. it's not just the indians who are coming back okay it is even cutting edge technology professionals and startups and leaders of the world mm-hmm. who are saying uh, we need to do the startup in india mm-hmm. and prime minister narendra modi ji said this very beautifully in the semicon india conference in gandhinagar recently he said in 2022 when we had the first semicon india mm-hmm. first edition of semicon india people were saying why india for right. semiconductor yes and today just 12 months on people are saying why not why are we not in india right you know and so i think uh, there is a change uh, a lot of talented uh, talent flow is moving back in the reverse direction to india okay. especially diaspora mm-hmm. and many many i i get to meet and talk to people i'll give you another example professor rao tumala mm-hmm. who is a legend in the area of semiconductor packaging okay he was uh, in georgia tech he was the head of uh, uh, vlsi in georgia tech and he is uh, very professor emeritus there mm-hmm. he has been pounding the pavement in india for the la- last 12 months okay as a, a like a man on a mission he's an old gentleman okay and he says i want to create in india semiconductor research that is at par with the rest of the world oh fantastic so, and he's mm-hmm. coming back from the us and doing that okay and so i find uh, that that trend or that sort of trajectory mm-hmm. has reversed people now see india as an extremely competitive and exciting place if you are in the innovation space mm-hmm. of course there will still be people who are in the it and its space who will see opportunities elsewhere in the world and we certainly don't want to create any barriers to mobility mm-hmm. but uh, but it is not just one way anymore it is certainly two way right uh, this is started recently this has been going on for a long time mm-hmm. so this is certainly more even today okay. but i can certainly see the trajectory and velocity of people returning home and wanting to do things in india uh, fast increasing right uh, we are focusing on manufacturing there's a lot of electronics manufacturing happening in india sure is tesla uh, what are we doing to get apple tesla etc look i'll days? i'll say, i'll go out on a limb uh, today abhijit with you and say mm-hmm. that after prime minister narendra modi ji's visionary pli policies mm-hmm. which are totally transformed electronics mm-hmm. in india mm-hmm. i mean we were nothing in electronics in 2014 right we were importing all our phones phones right yeah and today mm-hmm. we make all the phones in india right we were exporting zero mm-hmm. i always say zero batta sanata that we were that is our exports huh. and today we are exporting 1 lakh crores mm-hmm. of apple and samsung phones to the markets of the world right i will go out on a limb and say there is not one global electronics brand mm-hmm. that is today a global brand that will not be in india in the coming one or two years fantastic yeah and i'm saying this with not because i'm some astrologer mm-hmm. i'm saying this because i have such confidence in the way prime minister narendra modi ji has unrolled this and rolled out this pli scheme mm-hmm. that cisco is here apple is here samsung is here uh, you know every other telecom company is here mm-hmm. manufacturing to manufacturing right and today was the last day for the it pli 2.0 hardware PLI mm-hmm. Acer has signed up Asus has signed up both from Taiwan mm-hmm. Dell HP and HPE from the US okay they have all signed up for the PLI 2.0 mm-hmm. so 
I I don't want to speculate on Tesla uh, whether they are what their plans are. I certainly huh. am not privy to it. Right. But look, Tesla is a amazing company. It is a company that is an automotive company. Mm -hmm. It's a battery company. It's a uh, product that has fourteen hundred, fifteen hundred semiconductors per product. Mm -hmm. And uh, I see no reason. I can't see any other place that Tesla would be better suited mm. to set up a plant than in India. And I think uh, after his meetings with the Honorable Prime Minister in the US recently, he certainly, uh, Elon Musk is certainly exploring India as a, uh, as a potential base for Tesla. And I would go out on a limb and say that when we meet maybe a year from today, mm -hmm. uh, we will be all talking about uh, what fancy features on the Tesla you like or you don't like. Absolutely. What's the big vision 2030? We'll not talk about 2047. What's 2030? 2030, I think the, uh, I mean, I, I, I haven't thought that far ahead and I usually don't think that far ahead. Okay. But uh, uh, working with our Honorable Prime Minister uh, certainly gives you an insight into how he's thinking. Mm -hmm. One of the clear things that is coming out in his thinking and in the way our country is moving mm -hmm. is that we will certainly be the third largest economy in the world. We will cross Germany and Japan very sure. Very, very sure. Yes. Now, what does that mean? Hmm. Being the third largest economy in the world means we will have a digital economy which will be one of the biggest in the world. Mm -hmm. We will have an economy which is the third largest in the world. Right. And we will be one or two stepping stones away from being a full-blown developed nation. Hmm. And what does that mean in terms of, to, you know, to people listening to this? Hmm. Please understand, in the last six years alone, Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji's government has taken 13 crore Indians out of poverty. Right. 130 million. million yes. Now, imagine an in India where there is no poverty hmm. and that every youngster uh, whether he is in the remote village of Zuniboto in Nagaland or in Jammu and Kashmir or uh, down south or east or west is having the same conversations and same aspirations about his or her future that a young boy today or a young girl today has in Bangalore or Hyderabad. Hmm. Imagine that India. Yes, right. And if you think about 2030, I think that is the India that we really see in our lifetimes being possible. Right. If you had asked me nine years ago, would we be 20% of our GDP uh, digital economy, I would have laughed at you. If you had mm. said, uh, would we ever change the narrative of governance and this leaky governance system that we have inherited for 65 years and that Rajiv Gandhi talked about in 1985, I would have laughed at you. Mm. But we have achieved all that and more. Mm. So I see in tw by 2030, no reason why we cannot aspire to be of course, in technology, we will certainly be the leading nation of the world mm -hmm. or amongst the leading nations of the world because in the top three, there will be India, uh, China and the US mm -hmm. and uh, uh, India and US will continue to have these great partnerships in technology and innovation. And I think we'll certainly be a very, very significant player in the space of tech and innovation. But equally as an inclusive democracy that has really created opportunities for all its people. Mm -hmm. Unlike any other democracy in the world, 2030, in my opinion, is also that India. Right. And uh, your audience, for example, today when we talk about tech, mm -hmm. is still maybe urban and a little bit outside towns. Yes. Yeah. This is the way I would position it, that Abhijit in 2030, when he's doing his podcast, his audience will be all around the country and they will be relating to this conversation about semiconductors, AI, as much as the young boy or the young girl in Bangalore or Mumbai or Hyderabad or Chennai. Mm. And that I think is the power of the vision of our Prime Minister, which is that every young Indian must feel he or she has a legitimate aspiration mm -hmm. in this really changing world that we all live in and that he or she also has a good shot at uh, creating a career and a future for himself or herself. Right. Media is changing. What do you make of the podcasting space? It's a new thing in India. It's been oh, I, think it's, I think it's brilliant. I think uh, podcasts have a way of having conversations. Yes. As well as uh, get to uh, a, a lot of, uh, you know, outcomes and um, uh, messaging. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that is, 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 is informal 
people like it more and more because it is the reason why the old interviews on legacy tv channels used to work very yes. well which is finally people like these conversations on topics between two people yes not shouting screaming you know which is what unfortunately television has become that it has yeah. ah, so and you know in the old days when you talked about news and current affairs there was a significant part of current affairs hmm. which is about conversation yes two people having a conversation agreeing to disagree agreeing to agree whatever but it was finally a conversation yes news unfortunately in in today's age has left that as a non option yeah uh, on legacy tv channels yeah and i think podcasts are stepping into that space mm-hmm. and occupying it very very rapidly mm-hmm. and i feel personally i consume a lot of podcasts mm-hmm. okay. i i uh, and i i find it uh, uh, a lot more fulfilling and enlightening and um and ex- you know helping me expand my own thinking and awareness than any time i spend on television mm-hmm. uh, certainly so uh, i think it's a format that is here of course people have to keep it fresh and people have to keep it uh, lively because you're you're constantly going to have be challenged by short form videos yes of course on reels and stories and all of that yes and uh, but i think there is certainly going to be two audiences one which is uh, p- people wanting more measured something longer in terms of a conversation yes and there will always be people who want this instant gratification of flipping through and watching 18 things in 5 seconds so <laughs> that is something that the youngsters will always enjoy and right. uh, that will continue to be there Sir, I would like to congratulate for you for all the great work you've done, and I ho- wish you a lot more success in the future. Thank you so much for thank doing you, this. Thank you, Abhijit. Thank you for having this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. So that was the conversation. Hope you liked it. If you enjoyed this, please share this on WhatsApp and other media. Thank you very much, and I'll see you soon.